Welcome. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us for this month's Detect to Protect webinar. My name is Kim Schofield. I am from Stamus Networks, and I'll be moderating the webinar this morning and managing any questions at the conclusion of our session. So our webinar today is going to be presented by Mark Durrett, who is our Chief Marketing Officer, and Peter Maniv, our Chief Strategy Officer. Uh, so a few housekeeping notes uh, first. The webinar is being recorded and all of the attendees will receive a follow-up email with a copy of the slides and the recording and also any links to any reference materials we uh, share during the presentation. If you have any questions, uh, we are happy to take those and um, just enter those into the chat or Q&A section in your Zoom console. All right, Peter, next slide, please. All right, so I just wanna quickly review the information we're going to be covering today. So we're going to be exploring how you can use SELCS. Uh, SELCS is a free open source turnkey Suricata network-based threat detection and security tool. Um, how you can use that to hunt in the data generated by its built-in Suricata sensor. So you might be asking why network-based uh, threat detection? So the network is used by threat actors for delivering malware and initially compromising an environment. But it's also used for installing additional tools um, and moving laterally within an environment, uh, exfiltrating data and facilitating remote command and control. So the network uh, plays a crucial role in the overall security monitoring of forward-thinking organizations. So really the focus uh, of today's presentation is helping you gain better visibility into threats and suspicious activity um, so you can resolve incidents quickly and accurately before they can cause any damage to your organization. All right, next slide. Uh, we're gonna talk about Peter, give you a little bit of an introduction. So he is the co-founder and chief strategy officer of Stamus Networks. Uh, he's also a member of the executive team at OISF and he has over 15 years of experience in the IT industry and that includes enterprise level IT security practice. Um, he is a passionate user, developer, and explorer of innovative open source security software. And he is responsible for training as well as quality assurance and testing on the development team of Suricata. Um, that's the open source threat detection engine. So Peter is also a regular, actually, and frequent speaker and educator on open source security, threat hunting, and network security at conferences and live fire cyber exercises, such as Crossed Swords, DeepSec, Troopers, DEF CON, RSA, Suricon, SharkFest, that's a long list, uh, and, and also some others. So uh, that's an introduction to Peter, but before we get started, we're going to, uh, Mark's gonna talk with us just for a few minutes and give us a quick introduction to Suricata and Selks. Mark, you're on mute. Thank you, Kim. Next slide, please. All right, thank you. So uh, most of you probably do understand what Suricata is, but I thought um, just to baseline everybody's understanding, it's really important to, to just sort of uh, cover this really quickly. I know I'm standing in the way of our uh, featured speaker here, Peter Manev, but um, before before we hop over to him, just a reminder, to Suricata, it's a, it's a high-performance uh, network intrusion detection system, in, intrusion prevention system and network security monitoring engine. It is open source um, and it's owned by a community run nonprofit foundation called the Open Information Security Foundation. And that's uh, abbreviated the OISF, of course. And Kim mentioned that earlier in, um, in introducing Peter and Suricata is developed by the OISF and the, and the community. Um, so, the main function of Suricata is to monitor network traffic and to perform deep packet analysis for the purposes of detecting threats and extracting related artifacts that are crucial to understand the nature of a threat. So most people know Suricata as a rule-based IDS that generates a bunch of alerts when the rules fire, but it's actually much more. And as you'll see later, Today in this talk, Suricata also generates a broad variety of non-alert data that's incredibly valuable to the threat hunter. These include protocol transaction logs, flow records, PCAP recordings, associated files, and more. And Peter will go over this in much greater detail. 
Next slide, please. All right, as I mentioned in the last slide, Suricata is a high performance network IDS, IPS and NSM engine. And the, the, the word engine is important. Um, and as, as an engine, it becomes useful when it's surrounded by other important components. And that's where Selks comes in. So Selks is a free open source and turnkey uh, implementation of Suricata. And it's uh, developed and maintained by Stamus Networks. In fact, Peter Manev, um, who's on this uh, call today, uh, was the original and is the maintainer and developer, uh, primary lead developer around Selks. It was introduced in 2014 to showcase Suricata's capabilities, but over the years, it's grown in its capabilities alongside Suricata, and it's currently in version 7 with uh, version 8 coming out pretty soon. So it's a super versatile system that can be deployed on most Linux systems, including Debian, Fedora, CentOS, Red Hat, and Ubuntu. Um, perfect solution for small organizations, a home network defender looking uh, for a capable and effective IDS and M NSM system, sec uh, security educators, students, practitioners also looking to experiment with Suricata and the data it produces. Really powerful tool for all of that. It's called Selks because uh, it's comprised of uh, Suricata, Elastic Surge, Logstash, Kibana, and the Stam Stamus Community Edition. All those initials uh, make up the word Selks, right? Uh, and since then, it's actually, uh, uh, we've added uh, Archimy, and Evebox, and Cyberchef to the mix. So it's a pretty substantial tool set. Uh, that's all I'm going to mention about Selks. You'll get a chance to take a look at that a little bit later. Uh, next, I'd love to hand it over to Peter uh, for the next phase of this talk. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you very much Kim. <clears throat> much appreciated. All right, folks. So let's talk about a little bit about uh, like basic trend hunting concepts with Suricata. And also, um, and also um, look through a few ideas, a few cases um, that could be useful, and actually do some hands-on because I really like also doing hands-on exercise. So not just the slides, but also you know, uh, actually uh, see how it works in in reality. So. Um, First thing is first, some very high level basic principles of threat hunting. You know, you usually have a some sort of an idea, some sort of a hypothesis out of experience, out of knowledge, based on the environment that you define similar things of what specific malware APT might do. And you want to turn that into a hunt. But usually the most important thing is actually to go after TTPs. Um, you should plan those activities, you know, what tools to use, what log to use. Um, you should really never rely on one element alone. Context combined logic actually goes a very long way and it's most effective, you know, context in terms of the data that you have, context in terms of the organization that you're trying to protect, what that organization is doing, where it's located, data flows, network flows, all those things. Um, Deployment environmental specifics, you know, is it a regular uh, organization? Like, for example, uh, let's say uh, a head office in multiple locations, is it spread around? Are there cloud deployments involved? Is it a very specific organization? Let's say a power plant, you know, all those things come into consideration, of course. Um, <clears throat> usually once you have all those ideas, you would want to do some testing it and usually uh once you have completed and happy with the actual hunting techniques or queries or any logic that you've combined um you know you get some feedback lessons learned and you automate to the best extent possible um the automation is like it would depend end to end so whether it's network and endpoint logs and CM automatization and things like that. That depends on your setup specifically. But what you want to basically do is make a manual hunt once and then automate and then move on to the next hypothesis, hypothesis idea that you have for that specific uh, hunt. 
So um, here is just the very high level, some ideas. Well, for example, let's say in a typical organization, those, those really depend on the environment and deployment, okay? But let's say a typical organization, I don't know, a marketing office, a bank office, something like that, and user clients are usually not supposed to send or to, to start sending or at least attempt to do so. Uh, let's say SMTP and clear text from client is not expected or FTP or similar things. In some organization, this might be possible or expected, but in majority, I'm pretty sure that's not the case. Uh, why? Well, for example, Agent Tesla is one such malware that actually uses SMTP, FTP to exfiltrate. Not that these are bad by default immediately just because SMTP, but that is an unusual activity that usually hasn't happened in a while and all of a sudden starts happening. It's something to actually have a look at and investigate. Um, maybe you have production setup and in the production setup, all let's say production servers are only supposed to use the organization defined DNS servers. So not public DNS uh, services, no dynamic DNS and similar things. So that's starting to happen might actually indicate things that you need to you need to check out because it simply might be a policy violation, but it might also be a malware. However, that would be a starting point, right? So this would not immediately mean, oh, wow, we got breached. Or, but that would be a starting point, raise the flag, okay, something is happening here that apparently nothing else, let's say, it went through all other defenses, so to speak. Um, another one is um, actually a clear text executable download from a newly registered domain. Well, that's always kind of interesting uh, to actually have a look at. Um, a newly registered domain, especially ones that are you know a few days old or a week old, can actually be a good uh, uh, a good indicator that something um, is going on. And we will actually move on uh, through a couple of such examples today uh, that I think you'll find it very interesting. So here's some some basic basic examples and things that you might find useful. So um, well, first of all, let's talk about the three must knows uh, concept for Suricata when you're doing hunting. So first of all, what data is produced by Suricata? How correlation is performed inside Suricata with Flow ID? and how flow labeling with flow bits can impact context. And we're gonna give some examples. So for example, to begin with, the data that Suricata produces <clears throat> is plenty. So Suricata produces any and all sorts of uh, type of uh, protocol logs, anomaly logs, flow logs, file transaction logs, it does file extraction, it can do full packet capture or it can do conditional packet capture. What does conditional mean? Conditional mean basically that that's available in Suricata 7 and above. Um, it's a new feature in Suricata 7. It means it basically means that you have a pickup of the full session that triggered that alert. So all those events will be there um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, protocol logs, anomaly flows and things like regardless of alerts or not. Uh, the alerts are usually between 1% and 5% of the total data that actually Suricata produces. So it's important to understand that the data is there. So you have file transaction logs, PCAP, alerts, protocol logs, transactions, uh, file extraction is similar. All right, so that's concept one. So know what data Suricata produces or the tool that you're hunting with produces, in our case, Suricata. What you see here on your screen is uh, basically a pretty view of a default Suricata JSON alert. So all the information that actually you see on the screen is inside a Suricata JSON alert. Uh, JSON is just like a standard um, um, logging uh, format, so to speak. So in this case, I think it's a uh, yeah, it's an executable over HTTP, clear text. It doesn't happen often nowadays, but malware actually actively uses it. And not only malware, regular applications also do. Often malware resorts to it because actually clear text is not vetted so much. So they have a big chance as well. So whatever works, basically, it doesn't really matter. But in this case, we have in that specific uh, JSON alert, as you can see in the pretty view, we have all sorts of information, including uh, a JYP, um, MAC addresses, Ethernet MAC addresses, HTTP, um, 
payloads principles, server um, and response um, um, bodies, if they're present, HTTP header information, all that information will be there. So know your data. Now, concept number two or point number two uh, about knowing uh, Suricata when you when you engage in threat hunting is the so-called flow ID. This is simply a unique identifier of all the protocol logs or, or file transaction logs or alerts and anomaly logs related to a specific flow, a specific session. So regardless if there is alert or not, you can combine or relate to all these flows by this specific flow ID key. Each key has a specific um, you know, unique value. And that's how you can correlate it. So this ability in Suricata was actually introduced in 2014. So next year, it will be a decade. So this is there since almost 10 years. Um, it was introduced by Victor Julian, the lead developer of Suricata. And actually, the link there will bring you to <clears throat> that exact um, commit. So this is all data that Suricata produces. What does this actually mean and how does it translate? Here is another pretty view of that actually. So basically we have context about that alert. In this case, um, I'm not uh, really sure uh, what the alert about was about exactly, but it is SMB based. So in that, in that context, we have the alert JSON file itself, any another related alert to that specific flow that generated that alert. We have a flow record. We have 63 SMB records related to that specific conversation of flow between those two IPs that generated the alert. And we also have a PCAP file. So again, this is all data that Suricato produces. So it's very good and useful info when you actually threat hunting, because you know that data is there. It's a matter of utilizing it. So basically, yeah, uh, the flow ID will correlate all that protocol flow anomaly and file transaction data with or without alert since 2014. Now, um, another point three, um, another uh, point here is that any flow record produced by Suricata and its relevant other records. So for example, <clears throat> It could be TLS flow. A TLS flow will have the flow record itself. Will have a TLS protocol log. Will have, let's say, it might it might have um, um, a, an alert related to it or not, or anomaly event related to it or not. Doesn't matter. But any of those records produced can be actually marked and labeled. And I'll show you exactly when we move on to the hands-on because putting in different labels of flows of interest. Um, or not of interest actually empowers then a lot the query searching and actually unearthing um, finding, so to speak, unwanted actions, activities, and all those sorts of things in the network, including malware. Um, and not only malware, but also, uh, let's say, misconfigurations. Some devices might be misconfigured. That also It's also just about minimizing the risk, right? So... Um, thus, this is all allowing us to actually um, to to actually connect or or um, adjust our queries or hunting uh, logic uh, accordingly. What does this mean? Well, here's an example. Basically, you have an alert. So that alert might generate the alert is that signature part might generate the alert or might not. But what is important is it can be used to label the flow, the specific flow. So we have flow ID. In this case, these are SMB events sharing the same unique flow ID because they're part of that session, they're part of that flow. And this flow has been marked, in this case, eternal underscore malware. Uh, so we can use that logic to mark different types of flows and actually uh, come up with uh, uh, with a better system to make sense out of those um, out of those events and ultimately to detect um, unwanted activity or malware, of course. So again, this is inserted in any and all protocol logs, uh, flows, and and all those um, similar things. That's all those logs. Pardon me. That Suricata produces. Um, now, let's do a couple of examples here. 
I was mentioning as uh, one potential uh, good uh, idea is newly registered domains, NRDs. What does this mean? Before we answer that question, let's talk a little bit about an IOC match. We're going to talk about IOC. So there are plenty of threat intel vendors out there. So how good is an IOC match by itself? Is it enough or not? Imagine you have 100% known bad domain. I mean, it's 100%. And all of a sudden that triggers, so you see. So is it good enough for an instant response opening? I don't think so. And I'll give you a couple examples. Um, it could also be that something that's involved in there is called browser prefetch. So in other words, at least out of our experience <clears throat> with many of our customers in general, what can happen is a so-called browser prefetch to improve user experience in browsers will automatically resolve domains in the background so that when the user next clicks, it's much faster. So if a security analyst is reading a blog or a document in a website about just the newly released APT malware tool, um, there is a high chance of this could happen. And it has happened, uh, at least from, uh, from our experience. So that by itself doesn't mean, oh my God, we got breached or something like that. It's just a highlight of something that has happened. Okay, what about if it's 100% known IP, bad IP, and we have a connection? Well, it could also be the about IPs could be just scanning. They're just probing. Um, so, for example, it really depends on your um, on your setup. But if you are set up in a hosting provider where you have no control over the environment that you're looking at, for example, the endpoints, let's say my hosting provider, ISP, university, guest networks, things like that. Um, well, there's not much you can do there besides maybe just drop it on the firewall and things like that because these things are just scanning. So, of course, another more interesting thing would be, okay, see if you actually have any flow connections, any, any actually more exchange of information between those two endpoints and that 100% bound ID. So, actually, all I'm saying here is we need more context. You know, just that IOC, even if it's 100% known bad thing, that IOC by itself is not enough. We need more context to, de to deduce, actually, to figure out if act we had been uh, breached or if something unwanted is happening. Uh, so we need these um, network security monitoring events, protocol transaction logs that Ricardo produces, the PCAP recordings as well come in handy. Also, when an IOC match happens, it's very important, let's say, after the investigation to take that piece of data and go back in time and see if that has happened before. So in other words, a historical lookup. So Suricata will generate all those logs and events and you might want to see, okay, has this URL been visited previously? Uh, have we seen that same file hash previously last week, the week before and things like that? Um, matching... IOC matching in Suricata can be done in different parts of the traffic. Anything from IP to mail to file hashes, uh, domains could be matched in three different ways, actually, in the, if they're in the DNS query itself, if they're actually in HTTP hostname itself, or if they're like in the TLS SNI itself and things like that. So that all brings um, matching to, to a good level. But we want to be able to do a little bit more. Just the IOC matching by itself is just not enough. You need more. So we want um, we want to be able to match on millions of things, right? So the more, the better. Uh, we want it to be fast, no performance impact. We want it to do that you know, even at higher speeds, 40, 100 gig plus and things like that. Um, we also want to be able to uh, manipulate those records produced by Suricata and actually um, insert, let's say, uh, labels in there on the fly. So we kind of can do that very, very, very efficiently with a feature called Dataset. It's in the docs, use it, very efficient. Um, I've personally tested it and use it, love it, very efficient way of actually doing matching on, um, 
on um, on anything that you can use Ricardo too much for. However, how about we go a step further and we say, okay, we've matched the domain. It's matching on three different pieces of protocol. So we have the DNS query match, the TLS protocol, SNA match, and the HTTP protocol, HTTP host name match. But now I want all the protocol logs and the alerts and the flow logs to actually have a label in it. Just like in this case, uh, we have um, metadata flow bits, stamos dot neural register domain dot with entropy, higher entropy. Yes, Ricardo can do that at the exact same speed. Um, so it is here we actually, um, we're being enabled even more. So if we do a modern IOC matching on TTP, so to speak, and so what's a TTP? Well, basically, we know one of many, this is just a simple example, one of many things that malware actors do is register a bunch of domains, burn them out, see who responds to them, see who doesn't, um, or use them for all sorts of scanning activities and um, or all sorts of phishing activities and see if they go through. And then they move on and register more domains. So a newly registered domain by itself is not bad. And, and alone is not enough to conclude anything on it. However, in a combination with something else, it could be very, very useful. So if it's a new registered domain, uh, in a lot of cases, threat intel providers, even some of the biggest ones out there, even have supercomputers traversing the full internet in under 24 hours in an effort to find anything at you know, all um, uh, bad and, and analyze it. So it's on that level, actually, we're talking about. So, um, in other words, some things are obvious, some things are not, but we have to find out what's good for us and in such a fashion so that we actually can deduce, okay, this is bad or no, this is okay. So, what I mean by that here, let's have an example. The first domain that you see on top, at least when the time when I made the slide was 19 days, registered 19 days. So, and it's not a Microsoft domain is just obviously uh, quite fishy, so to speak. Login-office365.info. So this is actually, yeah, okay, that's not really pleasant. The second domain that you see <clears throat> at the time when I created the slide and when I checked virus total, as you can see on the screen shot in there, was created eight days ago. So this is not something that an end user is expected to either remember or type in their browser. The purpose here might be something totally different. And that's a, a, an example of domain that has high entropy in it. In other words, it's not something easy to remember or to type in, and it's quite random. Now, what can we make out of all that? <clears throat> let's have a look. Well, let's consider some TTPs uh, when using new registered domain. So, large transfers to and from newly registered domain, uh, clear text executable downloaded from a newly registered domain. Yeah, that's a red flag. Uh, it definitely is checking out. Well, we have a new SSH, SSH hash. So Ricardo can do an SSH uniquely identify SSH connection uh, and coming and going or actually from a host that has been in contact with a newly registered domain soon after that. Well, that's something uh, to be to be checked out. Uh, never seen before piece of uh, meta metadata. If you have new, uh, all of a sudden, uh, uh, FTP or SMTP communication, this is more about the search and analytics examples. The first examples that I gave are a bit more you can tackle with signatures in Suricata. Um, production servers doing TLS HTTP beaconing to a newly registered domain. Hmm. Something to check out, right? Uh, again, this is achieved more with uh, search queries analytics examples on the uh, on the CM and on the on, on the end data that Suricata produces, not so much in signatures. And again, large transfers to and from um, domains. How does this translate into actually reality? Let's have a look. Um, and I'm going to demo that to you uh, shortly. We the um, uh, public. Uh, pick up in actual hands-on. So here is the basic query. We have, I want, and what we're saying here basically is give me any executable download 
that is over HTTP, that has a status code of 200, and that is in a flow that has been marked to a new registered domain. So that is actually much more interesting to look at than simply, yeah, okay, it's an executable transform. So this is basically an elastic search query on Suricata data. That's it. Uh, what else? Well, here is another one. <clears throat> Here we are looking specifically at event type flow. This is flow records produced by Suricat. This is an actual example from a Kibana Elasticsearch query, but actually it can be translated into Splunk in pretty much uh, the same way. What, I, what we're saying here is give me all flows that have been marked with high entropy. High entropy meaning newly registered domains with high entropy. Give me all those flows and show me the TLS uh, protocols, e events only. The ones that are with application led here, that's what I mean. What we found out in this case is there's inside a 24 hour, there was 115 count from a specific IP uh, flows, uh, flows from a specific IP uh, in the organization. And that was actually an IP that was breached um, and that triggered an, an investigation. But that gave us the initial the initial seed, the initial hunt in there that was in there. So that was very that was very helpful. Um, what else? Well, <clears throat> simply large flows to a newly registered domain with high entropy. So here we have an excerpt um, like um, of a screenshot rather of a uh, some part of the flow um, record that Suricata produces. And in this case, we have 427,000 bytes to the client. Well, there is a little bit of a large transfer. So that's actually something interesting to have a look at. Now, um, <clears throat> again, remember, not all, we're not saying that any and all newly registered domains are bad. We're talking here in general with high entropy uh, domains. So that's the initial initial idea. It's like, okay, what's going on? Let's, let's check it out. Um, another example would be translate that into the flow query. So basically we're saying, show me all uh, larger flows that are, let's say, 10,000 or 100,000 bytes, 10K, 100K bytes more or more than that to a newly registered domain that's found in an HTTP host name uh, in, the, uh, in the network. That usually gives interesting interesting results, like on the screenshot in here. You see, you see right away out of, um, depending on the size of the network that you monitor, it could be millions or billions of flow logs. But that quickly could be narrowed down to these, um, you know, uh, five logs like that in here. So that gives you a better idea. Another way, and this was actually a very interesting case um, that we found out. <clears throat> we simply said, let's look at the HTTP protocol logs that Suricato produces. So these are not alerts. And show me all the flows that the, uh, the HTTP protocol logs that have been marked with high entropy newly registered domains um, and that have a status of 400 or between 400 and 410 sometimes it's 404 so this was actually an infected machine that you can see clearly the ping in there ping 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 that was actually uh, talking back to its command and control server it was a 404 but the message of the 404 status code looked quite legit no problem there, nothing raises suspicion, but when we actually looked at the data from a different perspective, it was uh, it was quite obvious that there's something not so traditional going on, especially in mind to where that host was located, you know, and clear text HTTP host name and your registered domain. Um, <clears throat> all those visualizations are actually that I showed you are like open source and available, um, and they're also part of SELCS. Um, so what I'm going to... Um, what I would actually like to do now is actually switch on over to the uh, part demo. And I'm just going to quickly uh, change uh, my screen in here for that. Uh, bring into the whole. So what I've done basically is um, in here, I've set up silks and I've run a couple of pickups. It's very easy. Basically, that was my command line to set up Selks. Uh, it's a Docker. In this case, it was a Docker installation. It could be done on any Linux uh, machine, like Linux OS, pardon me, like uh, Fedora, Ubuntu, CentOS, uh, Red Hat, Debian, and similar things. So it just spins up the Dockers. Um, 
And basically I run two uh, pickups in here. Uh, so that's that's all I did. So the first, I'm gonna zoom in here. So the first pickup um, uh, here that I've run is actually from the 12th of October this year in Kudus and thank you to Malware Traffic Analysis Net. It's, a, it's actually a public uh, pickup. And so, um, and the second one that I've run is actually, uh, this one is even three days old, actually. It was from the 23rd of October. So um, simply when I had the silks uh, come up, I went to the login interface, uh, user and password, the default one are silks dash user, silks dash user is the user and the password. Um, so this is the landing page of what you see in silks. And that's basically, and we're going to show you a couple of tools. That's the um, um, uh, Sirius or the Stamos Community Edition actually landing page in there. So from here on, you can go to the other tools. We use um, um, a Sirius as a rules management. Uh, it's an open source rules management uh, and tool for uh, Suricata and also a threat hunting um, a tool. We also have a couple of other uh, things incorporated into Selk, all open source tools like Evebox by Jason Ish from Jason Ish from the Suricata team, which is also a very cool tool. And the Elk stack, of course, um, Arkham and Mark cover all these. So quickly, I'm going to go to the hunting uh, page. And you can see it from, from here, from the switcher, you can actually move into any of the other tools. So as I mentioned, I replayed the two pickups, right? So we have both of them in uh, both of these pickups. And what I use, what is cool thing about uh, Selks here is actually, um, I can actually specifically zoom in on one or on the other. And often often enough I use in to switch in between cases just to see how some specific malware reacts in different environments once I have the pickup uh, captured and replayed. So it's actually um, a very interesting one. So the first pickup, let's say that's three days, uh, that was posted three days ago. Um, actually gave me all those alerts. Um, and actually have in mind, these are uh, basically uh, the alert events here. And there's also much more data behind that as well. So as you can see, we have a bunch of different alerts triggering. But what I want to actually zoom in is not on the specific alert that triggers the behavior. For example, as you can see, uh, common rat uh, is expected to be seen here. Um, async rat, also sig different signatures are triggering. But what I'm going to zoom in now is a little bit on the TTPs. So we have something in here. I've loaded these um, the matching of these newly registered domains. So when when I first run this, um, I was actually uh, looking at that and I said uh, again, this is basically a hunting evidence slash interface um, and we have different sorts of uh, filters that are predefined hunting filters here that you can use to actually highlight different types of the communication. So that's already built in. Again, it's open source and free. Um, and you can use any of these here. But Or you can create your own. And what I wanted to see here is quickly uh, filter on the message. And I was just going to do enter these newly registered domains. And I have here in this case six, right? So one is found in HTTP hostname, the other, the other one as well, but one is higher entropy than the other. I was like, hmm, that's interesting. Okay, that's just a different angle. Um, and when I scroll down to look at the different pieces of metadata, all right, so we see one of the HTTP hostname that was broken down in here is this person. And that was actually registered three days ago. Right, that's very, very, very interesting. Uh, and as you can see, it's a DGA um, and and quite verbose. Um, some some vendors already marked as malicious. This one here um, is not exactly something that you would expect a user to type in. It reminds, and this is the um, the high entropy one. And when you, when I went to virus total, this is four days ago. So remember, tomorrow this will be five days ago. So the new registered domains will actually. Uh, um, expire. But in this case, when I quickly review it, <clears throat> it was, yeah, there you go, DGA dot top, and it was kind of a little bit random generated. So when I actually went into review, because as I'm often reviewing cases, when I actually went to the review of the cases, um, as soon as you open one, and here is that prettified view, I actually see um, 
I see a get and a 200. I see something super unusual, which in the get request, we actually have a desktop and uh, the name of the desktop PC. Well, that's bizarre. And the response board is even more bizarre. Um, again, here we have the HTTP information, um, the flow information for that specific signature. That's a regular Suricata JSON alert that already contains that information. What was interesting in here, here is the HTTP part. And okay, that's a super bizarre way of actually to respond uh, in an HTTP uh, query response uh, situation. Um, and what I wanted to mention specifically here is this is where the flow marking comes in. So we have four different types, four different marks or labels on this flow. Uh, we have a suspicious um, TLD, Stamos Newly Registered Domain, and Stamos Newly Registered Domain with Entropy, and a GET HTTP. Now, all of the flows related to this alert, uh, all the protocol transaction records related to this alert are actually, uh, again, related to each other by flow ID. And in this case, we can see that, you know, we have other alerts in here, plus a newly registered highlights. We have two uh, file transactions. And those are, the, again, these are all correlated because of the so-called field called flow ID, which is by default in Suricata. Um, and all of these are actually marked. So here is our file transaction log that also bears the labels of um, of um, of the uh, metadata. We have the flow records and we actually have the HTTP uh, protocol log itself. All right, so that is actually something very interesting. That's now a absolute red flag because you're not supposed to have these kind of response bodies and and similar into um, into um, into basically a, a, a regular HTTP communication. And here is something much more interesting: um, execution context, and you can see some sort of encoding going on in and out. It is actually quite obvious and worrying that this needs much more attention than um, than a simple log. So again, this is from the perspective of okay, we actually have a um, um, high entropy or a new registered domain that's very, very young, still talking inside the network. As I was reviewing, this is one such as example. As I was reviewing the second example, um, I want to do exactly the same query as um, I did on the slides. I'm going to switch a little bit of context here. So there is my query. I saved it because it was interesting for this webinar. Basically, what this is saying is exactly what was on, what was on the um, the PowerPoint slide that I presented. We are asking Suricata's data to show us all executables with a status code 200 that are from newly registered domain. And here are the three actually alerts, for example, that are from newly registered domain. How do I know this is a newly registered domain? Let's have a look. So let's take the simplest one, policy exe. I'm going to go over here to alerts, and I'm going to go over to that specific alert. Now, uh, sure enough, it's a, it's an executable. Sure enough, the status code is 200, is get. I have the actual JSON log of that specific um, alert. I have the full HTTP um, uh, protocol information in here. And in here, I have the flow being labeled. The flow has stumbles.nrd, which is basically coming in from, it's marked as a communication from a newly registered domains and other pieces of that same um, data that Suricata produces can use it. Other pieces of the, the protocol or alerts or anomaly um, logs can actually use it as well. So that's where the power comes in. So actually this is something much more interesting to look at. And in this case, we have a file transaction it's a PE3 executable, of course, and that will also have the markings in here. So we also know it's a newly registered domain. So that part is actually much, much more interesting than just a simple executable transfer. Here are the HTTP protocol logs related to that specific alert. Uh, they also, uh, besides having the full response uh, headers um, and HTTP information data, they also have the actually marks or labeling on that 
flow uh, of that uh, uh, newly registered domain flow. So this is as far as hunting goes on, uh, you know, a, a signature based and all those sorts of things. But again, we're inserting a piece of metadata, we're labeling flows, we're correlating flows with something interesting, trying to match the tactics. Now, I wanna show you something else. In, uh, as I said, in here, we also have something called Kibana, which I'm sure you're pretty familiar with. In Selks, we have, by default, I don't know, I think about 28, 30, something like that, dashboards that are actually ready to use. They're present in Selks, and they're also open source. You can use them in any Elasticsearch Kibana setup, and they're as long as you have Suricata data. In this case, I'm going to look strictly at the flow records. And the flow records here for the past 24 hours, I'm going to go back a little bit of time because these was uh, these actually pickups. One is from this week, but the other one was from a couple of weeks ago, I think. And I'm going to update it. So these are the two pickups missed, not mixed. So here we have entirely flow record produced by Suricata. So this is not alerts. We have some different protocol logs, as you can see in here. So that's interesting to know. I also would like to show you exactly the same query as on the PowerPoint slide. So what does this mean? I will come in here and actually I'll paste that query. And that is actually something pretty simple to do. What we're saying is event type flow, show me anything that's um, any, any flow labeling that's with a newly registered domain, application protocol is uh, HTTP and Anything that's over, what is this here? 100, let's say 90 kilobytes or 100 kilobytes, something like that. And something very interesting, actually, we can observe in here. We immediately go down to um, a couple of transfers from a couple of different IPs, internal IPs. And um, actually, the flow age in one case is 101 seconds. In the other cases, is 1, 5, and 8 seconds. The full protocol log is actually here. It's very easy to correlate based on flow ID. I'm gonna jump quickly. This is Evebox also that is doing that uh, by Suricata native um, uh, correlation. And again, this is actually the same flow that I showed before, but from an entropy perspective, but this is actually the same flow correlated in here as I was showing in the hunting dashboard. So here we have file transaction, HTTP, alert, flow records, all of those are in. And basically all that information is uh, is in here and you can see the marking here. We can see which pack pickup is coming from. So very, very useful thing. Very similar thing you can do with file transactions. I'm just gonna quickly switch over here. So these two pickups actually generated 7,662 file transactions. I can very easily say something like show me all executables that are marked from newly registered domains. And I'm down to one such event. And basically in the dashboard, this is again, using file transactions uh, records from Suricata. And this is my actually transaction. And if I even have a checksum here, let's see if something will come up. Yeah, okay. That's the same file that we were, uh, we were actually reviewing earlier. So, um, and here is my full, file transaction log with uh, the checksums, with uh, all the file information in there and similar things. This is by default producer Suricata. One very interesting thing that I saw, HTTP transactions in these two specific pickups, okay? So there were 3,890 of them. And I actually looked more closely. This is the event type HTTP dashboard. So there was some interesting information here, whatever there is no information, naturally it will error. So we don't need to worry about that. But what I wanna point you out is this visualization here. Again, this is available on um, anywhere, um, anybody for anybody that's using Selks or for anybody that's using any uh, elastic search with Suricata data, uh, also available on GitHub Kibana dashboards from, uh, from us that we've created. One interesting thing here, we actually have a bunch of transactions and I wanted to zoom in specifically and only on newly registered stuff. And for that purpose, I'm gonna change the query here 
paste it. And basically what I'm saying is just show me anything that's been labeled with from newly registered domains. And when I zoom back now in, I have some very interesting results. I have this of my internal IPs is actually in the course of one pickup, I think it's responding in the course of four hours. In the course of four hours, it did 3,764 calls back to the CNC server. The CNC server was actually this domain, hostname, HTTP hostname, but the domain was newly registered with HTTP length two. That is very, very simply just doing CNCs, CNC command control checks. And you can see some others actually doing a bit bigger transfers right away. So I can easily make sense of those 3,800 or so events by actually having a look at and be like, okay, from your registered domain perspective, I'm like, hmm, this is actually a much uh, more easier representation. And um, how this visualization is actually done? Well, uh, very simple. This is actually the breakdown of the visualization. You know, it's just basically three different buckets sorted by length, HTTP hostname, and source IP. It produces exactly that, but I give the one condition on top that I want it to be from a newly registered domain. So a very more generic way to actually look at things from three different perspectives. Event type flows generated by Suricata, HTTP logs, file transaction logs, and we also have the alerts. But here's where all the context around it comes into play, right? So this is the type of context, the protocol logs, the, the file the transaction logs, the labeling of the flows. That's where that enables us to actually make a much faster, much better decision uh, about, okay, is this bad or not? Not the single IOC match or whatever match by itself. So it's much, much, um, much bigger than that. Um, actually, um, I think <clears throat> I am uh, kind of heading shortly on time. So um, I have this blessing of working with an awesome team um, and open source tools. So I have no problem talking for the next few hours or even a couple of days. So please excuse me. But Mark, I think, I think I'm going to transfer it over to you now. Um, if you, if you, um, if you don't mind. <laughs> And, yeah, that's, um, yeah, of course. Um, so that in order to um, protect me from myself, you know. <laughs> yeah, great stuff, Peter. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed that. While you know we're not here to uh, try to sell you anything, I just wanted to make sure that I had a chance to introduce you to Stamus Networks if you weren't really uh, familiar with us. So, Peter, would you mind flipping over to the next slide? First of all, all of that that Peter showed you is open source and free. So uh, I think that's pretty amazing. All, all that work that he did uh, and, and was able to demonstrate and, you know, all that's using tools that are freely available. So super, super powerful. So if you don't know much about Stamus Networks, um, we are, we're a nine-year-old company with headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana in the United States and Paris, France. And we have offices in eight countries. And we're really focused on helping enterprise security teams um, know more from their network data and respond sooner using those insights gathered from the network activity. Uh, we were recently recognized by Gartner in their 2022 NDR market guide. Um, and, and as you can tell, our roots are really in open source, particularly Suricata. And uh, our commercial high-performance network threat detection and response system is built on top of Suricata. And it's, it's designed to help uh, enterprise security teams use their networks to protect their organizations. So ne next slide, Peter. Just, just a little bit about our... Um, leadership in in the Suricata world. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we got our start in open source solutions and our you know our company is considered the world's leader in Suricata based network security and the team's been working with Suricata since back in 2009 and and has literally contributed 10 times more to the Suricata code base than any other organization outside the OISF. Uh, could you advance click? Uh, thank you. Yeah. So our commercial solutions called Stamus Security Platform 
It's an advanced network-based detection and response system. As I mentioned before, it's based on Suricata, and it, it's been deployed around the world in uh, over thir- in 13 countries. Actually, I, we counted those yesterday. Um, and uh, protecting some of the most targeted organizations in the world. And we continue to make contributions to the Suricata community, not just for Suricata itself, but in other open source tools that the team uh, shares with the community. So next slide, please. I'm not going to dive into too much detail here, but secure Stama security platform it, it consists of two different components. One or more network probes, which you can see in the diagram at the bottom here. And those probes can be deployed anywhere in the network uh, from in the cloud to uh, in headquarters, to a data center, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and those probes um, relay detection events and all of the metadata that uh, Peter shared with you to the Stamus central server, which we depict here at the top of this diagram. And that server aggregates security events from all the probes, does other another layer of detection and event triage and serves the user interface um, it, to the system and also serves as the integration point to other elements in the security stack. So that's all I'm going to really talk about there. Uh, could you take me to the next slide, please, Peter? Thank you. So with SSP, organizations are getting really a complete network-based threat detection and response system by uh, combining, what we do is combine the best elements of a modern network detection and response system uh, and the complete functionality of a legacy IDS and and NSM tool. So that gives um, organizations greater visibility. Um, The system is very transparent in terms of the detections. Uh, It's easy to understand what happened when an event uh, or uh, it triggers. Um, All of the details are are, uh, easily explainable and all the evidence is provided. Much of that evidence is provided by the system, the Suricata data that Peter explored a lot today. Um, Yeah, so uh, I think one of the really important things for many of our customers who are deploying in um, highly sensitive areas is that you can um, you can put the analytics console that is the Stamus central server on uh, in your own network controlled in your uh, in your cloud or on premise and none of your sensitive data ever has to be pushed up into a SaaS application um, you know at a at a, at a vendor's hosting uh, facility for example. So I think that's really important to point out. So that that's it on uh, Stamus Networks. Uh, would you go to the next slide, please, uh, Peter? Yeah, thanks. Oh, and we've got some additional resources here on threat hunting, on Suricata, on CELTS that we that we'd love to share with you. And the first most uh, recent announcement that we made, which was just last week, was a package of what we call Open NRD Threat Intelligence, and that is a uh, uh, threat intelligence feeds. There are three different ones for newly registered domains that can help you do exactly the, the kind of hunting that Peter showed today. And so you can either scan this code or when we send you a copy of these slides, you can go to the website and subscribe to that threat intelligence feed yourself and ingest that into your Suricata system. It's specifically designed for Suricata systems. And um, there's a bunch of other tools on our Stamus Labs uh, web page, uh, which you can also go to and take a look at. So next. And just to mention there, Mark, yes, this please. is a free uh, free. free Intel feed. So there's no, uh, the, you just subscribe to it. So we know who is using the, the, the feed and you can use some vetting, but it's actually free. There's no payment. Perfect. Great point. Thank you, Peter. Next, uh, next slide. Yes, sir. Bunch of links here. You don't have to um, copy them now. You'll get a copy of this presentation. But everything from you know how, how to find Suricata, Selks. Um, Peter was is one of the authors of this fabulous book called The Security Analyst Guide to Suricata. You can download a free copy of that. That's also, by the way, open source 
on GitHub. You can contribute to it if you feel like it. Um, all these links will be available in the copy of the presentation. So next slide, please. And then the last set of resources I wanted to highlight is uh, on the Stamus website, the resource library has tons of white papers, technical briefs, videos, et cetera. And our blog uh, is pretty substantial. And uh, we've got 42 articles on threat hunting with 80 uh, on Suricata. So a bunch of really good, powerful content that can help you in your job, in your effort to do threat hunting. So next slide, please. All right. Wow. We are right at the top of the hour. Thank you for joining us for this time. I think Kim is having some technical difficulties, so I'm going to help us wrap up. We had we had a question come in during um, early on. Um, sorry, we didn't get to that earlier, but maybe Peter, you can answer this. And the question is, can Selks be run on an ARM CPU uh, machine like a Raspberry Pi? Oh, uh, <clears throat> not yet. And simply because some packaging might not be there. So we're a Docker, Selks will be a Docker-based application. So some packages don't have, and I'm not talking specifically about Suricata or Elastics, but I'm talking about some specific dependency packages might not be also available in ARM. Uh, but this is an upcoming um, uh, thing when we expect to have this one actually um, uh, up and running uh, soon on ARM architecture specifically. We've had a few questions about that. It is very useful, I agree. We just need to spend a little bit of time to see exactly, okay, if something is missing from the dependency packages, can we actually do it ourselves or is it is it already there and just to compile it in? So the short answer is no, not yet, uh, but it will be there. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, Peter. If anyone has any last questions they'd like to get in for Peter or any of us, please drop them in the question uh, panel on your Zoom panel, excuse me, and um, and we'll cover that. We'll give people another couple of seconds to do that. Sure, sure. And while we're waiting, as I mentioned, these slides will be sent out to you and uh, we'll give you a link for uh, the video as well, the video replay. Also, so I'm just uh, thinking out loud now, something that might be interesting. If you, Even if you have questions later on, we have a Discord uh, channel where you can actually just jump in uh, at any time and talk live to, uh, there's hundreds of um, other Selx users out there and also get some input uh, from, uh, from uh, other uh, experience, uh, let's say, Suricato or Selx users as well. So if you okay. yep, super. get to ask the question now, you can more, you please feel more welcome. You can jump into the Discord channel. We've got a couple questions. A couple more came in just now. Sure. Peter, so what are the specs for achieving 40 gigabits per second on Suricata is a question. Um, <clears throat> out of the top of my head, I cannot quote them, <laughs> but I would say uh, but I would say this is this is a hot topic, and I see I think there is a good amount of documentation uh, that you can find online that is free. One of the pieces of documentation will be in the Suricata uh, website, the help links, uh, Suricata uh, read the docs. The other one will be an article called Septon Suricata Extreme Performance Tuning that I co-authored with Michael Prozinski. Uh, we actually it's on. Uh, basically on GitHub as well. If you Google search it, you'll find it. Um, it is um, actually a step-by-step -step and actual, an, an actual um, exact commands and things we did to optimize a Suricata and do the extreme performance uh, tuning back then. Uh, so it's the article is called, there's two documents, Septon 1 and Septon 2. Uh, and, and they walk you through every optimization that needs to be done. Everything from the NIC and what kind of network cards uh, we tried and we used to the Suricata configuration to um, BIOS optimizations, rule sets, and similar. Okay, great. Thank you, Peter. Thank and you. We can add that to the links as well. I just uh, uh, just posted it in the in the chat. Yeah. Um, okay, found it on Suricon Net. Says. Uh, uh, the questioner. Excellent. 
All right. So we've got another question that's, uh, is there any way to integrate Selks using Suricata on PFSense as a sensor? Uh, I am not sure because I don't know PFSense that well. Uh, so there might be a way. Um, basically, I would think so. Uh, because again, Selks is Docker-based, so it's very easy to spin it up um, inside other operating systems or environments. Um, but that might be a better question for the folks from uh, from PFSense, I guess, uh, because I actually don't know the, the in internals of uh, PFSense. Okay. All right. Thank you, Peter. Okay. If there are no other questions, we can wrap this up. Thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you.